World Business Report in one hour on BBC World. Now on BBC World, Tim Sebastian presents another in our week of special editions of Hard Talk in India. When it comes to disease, India leads the world in some of the most serious categories. But sometimes cure is more about changing attitudes than giving drugs. My guest today heads up a small organization that cares for terminal cancer patients. How did she break through the wall of ignorance, suspicion and fear that surrounds the illness? Hamala Gupta, very warm welcome to the program. Thank you. How far is India in denial over the serious illnesses that it has? I'm afraid we are quite a way in, into denial about cancer and I suspect about HIV AIDS as well. You had your own experience of this. You were diagnosed with cancer when you were in Canada in 1985. How long after you got home before you realized that it was a source of shame instead of sympathy? Well, it happened even while I was going through my diagnosis in the sense that I found that my parents were rather reluctant to share the news with those who had heard that I wasn't too well and wanted to know what was wrong with me. But it wasn't till I came back that I realized that no one talked about cancer and if you did, uh, people chose to look the other way and change the conversation. And I think that's when it really hit home. Your family simply wouldn't accept it? No, they accepted what I had, but they weren't willing to share that information with others. So they lied to people? Well, yes, in a way you could say so. Except, of course, for my husband and uh, my family who were with me in Canada, where there was no such thing. And I think this was what struck me even with greater force, because I had experienced uh, my cancer in an environment where there was no need to hide it. And coming back... But there was caring and sharing. And, and there was caring. Psychological and support. And absolutely. Things like the things that are so important when you're faced with a life-threatening illness. But when you tried to talk to friends back here in India, what was the response? Well, they felt uncomfortable because I could see that they felt rather sorry for me. Uh, they didn't feel that I had much of a future. Uh, they wrote you off. I think they did. I could see it in their eyes. They wrote me off for, because for them, cancer was synonymous with death. And obviously, they just didn't know enough about the disease and the progress that had been made. So somehow, by just being in their midst, you were literally seen as, as the angel of death. That's correct. And, and I think I reminded them of their own mortality, which we are all very uncomfortable being reminded about. And there was no way to break through this. There was no way to sit your friends down and actually say to them, look, this is the situation. It's not catching. Well, what I realized was that really it was up to me. The way I conducted myself and the way I handled my illness uh, would have uh, an effect on those around me. And therefore, I chose to talk about it. I uh, let them see that I was leading a normal life. I told them about what I went through when I had cancer, whether they wanted to hear about it or not. And I think over time that did have an effect. They realized that I was willing to talk about it, that it was not something that I feared unduly, that I had come to terms with it. And I think to some extent that also helped quiet their fears. What about on the professional front? Because you found almost a brick wall, didn't you, when you came back? Yes, I did. Uh, I, I suddenly found that people, even professionals, uh, stressed the fact that I had had advanced disease, and I was there for checkups, but you know, the prognosis really wasn't that good. And this was not the attitude I had faced when I was uh, undergoing my own treatment in Canada. And then when I visited the hospitals, I found people sitting in those waiting rooms with their heads down, not conversing or talking with each other. It was just as if they were waiting to die. You went to one job interview and they told you it was a disease for the rich, didn't That's they? That's right. 
amazing. That's, that's, and this is someone who was heading a, a health-based non-government organization. And he turned to me and he said, cancer is a disease of the rich. Poor people don't get it. And I was shocked. I said, what century are you living in? Cancer can strike anyone, anytime. And then I just realized how ill-informed we are about this illness and how our impressions are formed and so many misconceptions. How much were you shocked by this level of ignorance and how much did you feel isolated and rejected by society? Well, I think it, it was shocking and there was a sense of isolation. But I realized that to some extent, uh, I had to, it was, the onus was on me also to break out of it. And uh, one of the ways of doing that, I thought, was, was not to hide my diagnosis, to be very open about it, to be visible, to let people know that you could lead a normal life after cancer, that there was hope after cancer. And I thought that this was, this was something that I need, now needed to do, even for myself. But even with your husband telling you you should hide it, with your family telling you Well, you my husband was a little anxious that it could perhaps have an effect on um, the possibility of my career, if I was looking for a career. Uh, he was also concerned that our son, who was quite young at the time I had cancer, uh, would, you know, it would leave some kind of uh, negative impression on him as he was growing up. Uh, so I think these were his concerns, uh, but um, I must say I chose to ignore them. So you weren't angry or hurt by this? You simply thought that this was your battle and you had to get on with it? Well, I think what I realized was that really the problem wasn't mine. The problem was with the other people. Um, in, in, in a way, but I felt sorry. they surrounded you. It was your society. Know, you couldn't break out from no, but, them. But I felt sorry for them. It, obviously, it was their own fears. Uh, and their inability to, co to cope with their fear and their ignorance that was uh, leading them to, uh, you know, to react to me in this way. So I realized that really they needed to be better informed, they needed to uh, know that they were people who survived cancer and could lead normal lives. But the doctors were very discouraging to you, weren't they? And I realized over time why, because 80% of the patients they see with cancer in this country come with advanced disease. Obviously, those are patients who do not have a long-term survival ahead of them. So I tried to explain to myself, perhaps this was the reason. They put you in that category. I mean, they said pretty heartless things to you, didn't they? They did say pretty heartless things because they felt I had an advanced lymphoma. And uh, as far as their experience was concerned, uh, people with advanced lymphomas didn't do that well. So again, you were written off, weren't you? I was written off, yes expected to die, told that you were dying. Yes. And really left on the scrap heap professionally and, and, and socially. That's right. And people said, you know, poor thing now, the only thing she can do is some kind of social work. Were you suddenly aware that this then was the fate, not just your fate, but the fate of millions of people? Yes, I time? did. And I was absolutely devastated by this knowledge because I thought, you know, here are people who need to ha get their lives back who need to be rehabilitated, who need to be made to feel that they still have something worthwhile to contribute. And they're being denied this opportunity. So you decided to fight back. You set up your own support group That's in the right. 1990s. Yes. How much resistance did you face from the medical profession? Well, I remember the first time going to the cancer hospital and uh, mentioning to the doctors that I'd like to start a support group. And the response I got was, but why? In India, people have the family. You're coming from the West, you see. In the West, they don't have family, so they need support. And I found this astounding because, frankly, when I went through my diagnosis, my husband perhaps needed even more support than I did. So the family is in crisis as well, and there seemed to be a lack of recognition of this. You came across time and again instances where families rejected those who were ill, didn't you? Tell, tell me about some of them. There was a man, for instance, who had fluid in his abdomen and he yes. needed it tapped. And his daughter-in-law basically threw him out. That's she? right. She said, you can't do that here. I have young children and I'm not going to place them at risk. So there again, the fear of contagion and the fact that, you know, people actually feel that it's something that can spread. Uh, you know, I, we've, we've had patients who have been isolated physically. They've been thrown out of the house, they're occupying a little corner in the veranda. 
uh, they're not allowed to uh, come in anymore, their meals are given out to them, their dishes are washed separately, their clothes are washed separately. And what is so amazing that many of these people are so-called educated people who harbour these fears. What do you say in cases like that to the families? How do you combat those entrenched attitudes? We just sit the families down and say that there's, you need to understand what cancer is. You must realize it's something that you cannot catch. And this person right now needs you around them. They need your love, they need your affection to be able to lead a good quality of life. And the response when you say this? Well, sometimes people are not ready to accept it. They still fear it. They say, well, you know, as long as we don't know what causes cancer, there's always that little bit of fear that perhaps it is something that there is a germ or something involved in it. But I think the majority of people, and this is where I think our home care service works well, because we are going to the families again and again. We slowly build a rapport with them. We are participating in their lives uh, outside the clinic, and very often they're coming to us with their own personal problems. They are over time willing to accept what we have to say. There was one terrible case, wasn't there, of a woman who had cancer of the ovaries, mm -hmm. um, literally forced away from the house, sent back to her oh, yes. parents. Yes. And, and never saw her children again, did she? She never saw her children again and, you know, this was her greatest pain. And unfortunately, one of the reasons why women get sent back is because of the cost of treatment. Uh, the husband's family is simply not willing to bear the cost of treatment. And they feel that if the woman is sick, her parents should be the one who now, uh, you know, get the loans or whatever they have to do, sell their jewelry, their house, their land, because very often that's what people have to do for treatments. And they just simply don't want to do it? They don't want to do it. They feel that this is a burden that's unacceptable. There was one woman you came across who had a mastectomy, who yeah. her husband was particularly brutal about her. He was he? extremely brutal and the mastectomies in our group were absolutely devastated by what he said. And that was that, you know, she, she's a broken toy now, she's of no use to me. So, you know, you can see there are a lot of issues um, regarding human rights, regarding so social issues, economic issues that impinge on a diagnosis of cancer. The man who had bone cancer and had to have his leg amputated. Terrible decision to try to, to get a job, wasn't it? Terrible the, effort. Here was this that. young man, a very brilliant, a, a, a beautiful person with a, a widowed mother who had spent her last penny on uh, his treatment, felt he needed to get back, give, uh, give her some kind of a life, wanted a job. And this was what he was up against. Uh, he phoned me and said, what do I tell them? I'm, I have to have a physical done. I've passed the exam with flying colors. Should I tell them I lost my leg in a car accident? Because I fear if I tell them the truth, I'm not going to get the job. And I said, well, you know, it's difficult for me to tell you to lie. But you have to think about it and see whether this is really something that's going to help you in the long term. Because tomorrow someone who knows you may come and, you know, give them the information. And then, you know, everything you said would be suspect from then on. And he chose to tell them the truth. And he didn't get the job. How upset do you feel when you hear stories like this? I feel awful. I feel awful because today 50% of childhood cancers can be cured. And my apprehension is... If they're reached is, in time. If they're reached in time. We are making progress in cancer. But the point is, what does this mean for people who recover for a cancer survivor if they're not going to be accepted? If they, there's no prospect of marrying, for example. In our country, we have arranged marriages. Very difficult when it comes to marrying a girl who's had a brush with cancer at a young age and is now completely cured. Families have to hide the diagnosis. One even suggested that, that she marry a disabled man. Exactly. He came to me and he said, now the only person who will accept her will be someone with a problem, like a disability, a physical disability. And this bright, wonderful girl, you know, being perceived in this way by her own parents. So it's not the people outside who are uh, sending you these messages, but very often people who are your primary support structure. You began visiting hospitals, you tried to brighten up wards, but you got even resistance from 
relatives there, didn't you? That's right. People came up to us and said, you know, what business do you have to put up these bright pictures here? Don't you know people are dying here? They need to see gods and goddesses on the walls. And uh, there was even an instance where uh, when we, you know, we'd go and talk to patients and family would come and whisper in their ear and say, these people are lying. They're not survivors. No one survives cancer. Don't believe what they say. It must have seemed at times as if you were fighting a brick wall. The attitudes were so entrenched, weren't they? The attitudes are, were so entrenched, but I thought that, you know, if we came out and we fought them and we were visible and we said, here we are, we've survived, we're leading normal lives, th this is some way of breaking that silence. But the fact is that the people you came to meet with the illness were mostly too late to help, weren't they? Unfortunately so, yes. As I mentioned earlier, 80% of them come with advanced disease. And so, what was left? Palliative care. This is why you've come for palliative care. It's exactly. Here, there, there was just no palliative care here. All you were told was once you had finished all your money uh, and, and finished all the treatments was, sorry, we did our best. The cancer's back. Take your patient home. My concern was what happens to these patients and their families? Where do they turn for ongoing support? Where do they turn? Well, they were more or less left to their own resources because there was no doctor, local doctor, who was willing to treat them because this is a patient you're going to lose. And doctors want success stories. They want people who are going to get better. So tens of millions of people may be dying in isolation, despair, and ignorance around the country. It's a frightening picture, isn't it? It is a frightening picture. Tell me about the government attitude. You went to see a member of the government to ask for permission to stage a remembrance in a park. What was That's the right. attitude that you encountered? Well, he was absolutely brutal. He turned around and said, why are you spending your time with people who are dying? Let them die. Was this a minister? No, he was a government functionary who held a very, uh, you, you know, high position in the government and we needed his permission to hold this event in the park and he says I don't understand why you're wasting your time there are too many people in this country we need many uh, less people let them die and he turned to this friend of mine who was with me from the UK and said it's all right in her country where they don't have that many people they have to try and do whatever they can till the end but we don't need this I mean just unbelievable how shocked were you by that I was absolutely shocked because I realized that we really lack empathy and that's a very sad situation. Has the individual ceased to matter? I think somewhere the individual has ceased to matter. Perhaps we are too many and uh, to that s extent we are devalued as people. So what is the wake-up call to the government? What, what would you say to the government that thinks this way about its own people, about its own individuals? What well, message do you want to get through to them? Well, what I would like to tell the government is that I think they have a responsibility to their citizens to see that they have a right to life, right till the moment that, you know, they still have their breath, they're drawing their breath, and that we need services from uh, the time of early diagnosis, from prevention onwards, to palliative care. There is no national screening, is there? There is no national screening. No it's national awareness program. No national awareness program. It's left to uh, tiny little NGOs or individuals to do their little bit. We need to start education in the schools. What you're saying is that most people in this country have to face this illness with no public provision whatsoever, do they? No public provision whatsoever. They're on their own. And this is why we feel it's so important for us to go out there, to reach out to people, and to let them know that we care and that we do have the expertise available to also make sure that they continue to be comfortable right to the end of their lives. What about lifestyle changes? Because smoking is, is huge in this country, isn't it? Something like 50% of males use some form of tobacco. That's Can correct. you get a message through to people about how harmful this is? Well, there again, I feel that we really have to start with the young people. We have to go to schools because I'm not sh uh, uh, too sure about people who've already got addicted to nicotine. That's a much harder uh, group to really uh, talk, 
about uh, changing lifestyles too. But I think the young people, that's our hope because most people start the nicotine habit around the age of 20. And if we can target them young enough, if we can include this in the school curriculum, I think there's a, a good chance that the coming generation at least will be spared uh, the tobacco addiction which results in so many um, chronic illnesses. It, it's a big if, isn't it? Because while cancer cases are leveling off in the West, developing countries are set to provide 70% of the numbers that are going to, to rise Absolutely. by 2010. Yes, they? and the cigarette companies are targeting our part of the world. With high tar cigarettes. With high tar cigarettes. And people are unaware, perhaps, of uh, the, the effects of this um, uh, of this addiction that they choose uh, uh, you know to make part of their lifestyle cancer isn't a fashionable disease here you had cancer awareness day in early in november and it passed by with no notice whatsoever absolutely it's, it's hiv aids now that's in fashion that's the new kid on the block seems to hog all the 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 uh, you know the, uh, the limelight the newspapers are full of it and yet, as you mentioned, you know, it's really going to be cancer that's going to be in the, in the, on the increase in this part of the world. And we're, we're choosing to ignore it. For your organization, what you're asking for is very little, isn't it? $40 buys palliative care for a month. That's correct. It doesn't seem much to ask for, does it? Mm. But it must be extraordinarily hard to raise the money in this country. It is very hard because, as I mentioned to you earlier, people are, are not willing to be associated with a cause where, they, where there's death and dying. And really, what we have to get them to see is that it's really about living. It's about living well. And that each of us has a stake in seeing that we have services that enable us to do that. Because uh, unlike what some people may believe, Cancer can strike any one of us, any time. And I think that by investing in palliative care and other such services, we are investing in our future. When you say to the government that you need this money, what do they say to you? They say, well, you know, we have limited funds and we have to set our priorities. And if you can also do, if you would rather do awareness, I think it would be a little easier for us to give you money than palliative care. This is extraordinary. 80% of your cancer population needs this care. And it's not a priority. Certainly, it should not be at the expense of prevention, education, also very important. But I think they all must go together. Prevention, treatment, palliative care. They cannot be separated. One cannot be at the expense of the other. We would certainly like to see people coming earlier and earlier for treatments. Uh, living longer and longer, but the sad truth is that that is going to take a number of years, if not decades, to happen. In the meantime, what do we do with this huge population of people who need to be supported and cared for? And this is where I find that the rigidity and myopic view of the government uh, is a real barrier to development of cancer services here. You see people day after day in terrible states, terrible psychological, terrible physical states. Do you ever go home at night and think, it's too much, I can't go on with this, not getting anywhere? I think what gets me down is the attitude of the government and the bureaucracy, frankly, not the patients we look after. We see so much courage, we see so much beauty, we learn so much about living and dying from our patients, that it is really, I would say, a wonderful opportunity to grow as a human being and I always remind myself about that and that's what keeps me going and your own health you're cured no return well I'm certainly cured of the Hodgkin's I don't know what else awaits me around the corner <laughs> but uh, so far so good so you're living proof that for people in this country that cancer can be overcome that cancer can be overcome and that we need to take it out of the closet we have nothing to fear it's not our dirty little secret Amala Gupta, it's been a great pleasure having you on the program. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.